Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Almost Dropouts podcast. I'm your host, Davik, and today I have Sanjeev Musavleti. Um, Sanjeev is a sophomore at University of North Carolina, studying his dual degree at, in computer science and business administration, and has a lot of experience in venture capital, startups, and consulting. So he founded Lux Libertas Ventures, UNC's first student-run VC fund. He is a VC investor and early employee at Odds On, which is a Boston-based uh, student-run VC fund, and he made the fund's first investment. He led key strategy projects for white commoner startups, Nabis and Bamboo, and, digital trans- and has led digital transformation efforts for Lenovo and the F300 pharmaceutical company. And in his free time, he's an avid longboarder, Dallas Mavericks fan, weightlifter, and thrill seeker. So I want to introduce once again, Sanjeev, to the podcast. Thank you so much for coming on. Thanks, David. You know, re- really excited to be here and, uh, you know, appreciate the introduction. Yeah, for sure, man. So, I, I mean, just getting started, you know, what got you into venture, venture capital and into the startup world? Yeah. Um, so, you know, ever since I was young, I've, I've really had this strong fascination for, for strategy and, and solving complex challenges. Um, and I attribute a lot of that to, you know, a strong relationship towards chess and, and speech and debate um, right. through my early life. Um, ended up realizing that I could use a lot of those skill sets to positively impact the world around me. Um, so in high school, did a lot of work in the social enterprise space. So, you know, built a nonprofit that raised a few thousand for local teachers struggling with leukemia, um, built a TEDx conference focused on, you know, empowering unheard voices in Oklahoma, um, and also did some, some biotech work focused on empowering, you know, patients that were underserved. Um, so a lot of, you know, operator experience. And, and when I got to college, you know, I thought that was it. Um, basically you could just build companies, you could just go through the process, really didn't know much. Um, right. so when I got here, I, I, I started working at a, at a, a healthcare or not healthcare, an HR tech, um, virtual reality startup up in New York city called square teams. Um, mm. and so they were going through their initial stages of funding. And so really realized, okay, cool. Like there might be another side of the table. Um, but I was right. still pretty locked in my, my builder mindset. So um, my first little foray into the venture capital world was actually a fellowship with um, Rebel One Ventures up in New York City. Mm. And so I actually only did this because I, I wanted to go to Y Combinator. I wanted to be a founder. Yeah. Um, I wanted to see the other side of the table. Um, and, you know, instead, I, I fell in love with the process of finding gems in the in the rough and, and, and building up companies and, and helping to scale you know, hundreds of companies to become unicorns. Right. Um, that's really influenced the the rest of the way I've operated, especially mm-hmm. as I've continued to you know, build funds, to make investments and, you know, for like lead strategy projects for startups. But it's always kind of been for, for that goal of how do you build the most change in right. the world, make the most impact. Right. Yeah, no, it makes sense, man. I mean, um, it, it, I think a lot of people, you know, come into the, come into wanting to found a company, but a lot of people don't think about the other side, like you mentioned, yeah. you know actually yeah. funding these companies, making sure that they have enough capital to do what they want to do um, and ultimately scale the company. So it's really cool that you got that experience from that fellowship. Um, and I guess, you know, to sort of, if you want to touch on that, like what, what was the fellowship like? Yeah. So, so, you know, shout out to, to Sergio Marrero. He's, he, he's like the general partner and founder of Rebel One, um, okay. done an incredible job democratizing access to VC knowledge. Um, and, and so I was part of one of his latest cohorts, um, just for like, like three months, worked with actually industry professionals. So, you know, consultants from BCG looking to transition in, uh, bankers from, from Barclays, et cetera. Um, and it was really great. You know, we, we, we had live deal flow every Sunday. So talked about deals, learned to evaluate them, um, had a lot of really strong training on the venture math and, and the benchmarks you have to hit and, and think right. through, especially at early stage investing, um, and then, and then it all kind of culminated in actual investment reports and due diligence where you're evaluating companies, meeting with founders and, and kind of making those, the, bringing it to committee and, and working with venture capitalists to, to really see how the process went. Right. Um, and, and this was one of the most hands-on, you know, robust fellowships I've ever been a part of. I've been through like a few right. um, Ripple Ventures based up in, in Toronto, uh, okay. Two Sigma, you know, there's, there's some other cool ones like Soma Capital was another really phenomenal one. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think, I think Rebel One was really where it all started for me. And so it has a special place in my heart. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And uh, super interesting. Like, like you mentioned, you mentioned, you know, democratizing VC knowledge. And I think that's one of the big things with venture capital is that even people who have considered it perhaps as a career are interested in it. It just seems like such a barrier right now mm-hmm. uh, for so many people that uh, they don't really know where to begin. So it's great to know that there are these fellowships, at least for students. Um, I, I'm 
you know, I assume just for students, but um, even then, like just for students to get into venture capital. And so that's, that's super interesting, man. Yeah. And, and honestly, this, this democratization and kind of um, in, inequities within ventures is, is a really critical component, because if you think about it, only 1% of funding goes to, to women or, or people of color. Um, right. Which, which is a really, you know, huge problem, especially because given that most people are looking for signals like, oh, this person went to Harvard or Stanford, therefore their startup has to be good um, mm-hmm. instead of, you know, really looking at substantive business and, and details around it. So, you know, I'm really proud of a lot of the initiatives that venture capitalists are making today to build, you know, minority focused funds like Harlem Capital um, right. and really succeeding in this space. But that's something that our generation um, has to do a really great job of to, to push forward and actually create that change we demand to see. Otherwise, we're going to end up with funds that are 99.9% white males and continue right. to have that, that access to capital locked. Right. Yep. And, and you know, I think that that's definitely something that's really been great. There's an emphasis that we want to move this capital uh, to a whole diversity, a diverse uh, amount of startups. And so mm-hmm. uh, super cool, man. And so you know, I guess transitioning into there, you have, you know, you worked at a couple funds, you, you started your own fund. So uh, for startup founders, you know, uh, one of the biggest things, obviously, getting venture capital or, uh, you know, getting uh, capital to fund their startup. And so what do you prioritize when you're looking at startups and um, how do you evaluate them? Yeah, um, that, that's a really great question. Um, and, and I think there are probably three things we, we largely focus on. Um, so it's team, product, and then market. Okay. Especially at the earliest stages, those are kind of the critical factors um, for investments and, and any kind of, you know, follow on investments there as well. Right. Um, with regards to the team, and I can kind of like walk through this with, with the, my, my investment, because I actually have a portfolio company now, um, thanks odds on. So, um, you know, when you, think of, when you think of team, right, you think of, you know, incredible founders that have the, both the passion that this is what they, like, this is what they want to do when they wake up in the morning. Um, and, you know, this is the thing that they're like, they, they're the people that can win in this space because right. there's a lot of people who have the same ideas. There's a lot of people who are attacking the same problems. Um, but when you back a horse, you have to make sure that horse finishes first and finishes faster than everyone else. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, when I looked at uh, my, the company I invested in was called Viv, um, founded by Katie Diasta. Um, they're essentially eco-friendly period care. You know, when I met Katie and the team, you know, I can clearly see that this was a core issue for them um, as the main consumer of, of like, poor period care products that were yeah. unsustainable, you know, not really, like not successful for, for a lot of their, their needs. Um, and so really felt that passion. And that's something that you see when you, when you first meet with the founder, it, it clicks almost immediately. Um, right. And so, and that's also something that a lot of invest, a lot of founders should think through as well. So like, it's not just, will you, will this investor give a check for me, but also, um, is this investor the right investor for me? Because this is right. the person who's giving you checks, who will be working with you day in and day out over right. the next few years. Um, the second kind of component that I think is important is this idea of product. So a lot of early stage investing, you might not have a super robust product or extremely robust product market fit, but um, there is a large focus on, you know, where are you going? What is the vision behind this product and how have you tested it? So right. you're making when you build a product, you're, you're making str- critical strategic decisions at pretty much every point. Um, and, and what we want to know is that those strategic decisions are based on data or based on consumer interviews um, or based on real strategy, because that proves that, you know, you not only have the passion to build a product, but you've already started that process. Right. Um, and the last piece that's probably the most important is about this idea of marketing competition. Um, and so, you know, what are the players look like in this space? Right. You know, how do you how do you compete against them? Um, and so one thing we noticed with Viv was um, that a lot of the companies in the area, their product was just far inferior. Like it like it took 800 years more to decompose one of those tampon products compared to a Viv product. Right. And they were just completely better. They were cheaper products. They were cheaper, more sustainable. They're winning the product game. They're launching new product lines. And also all of their competition had gone on to either be acquired or, or reach like series C, series D funding rounds. And so um, there, because there was no barrier to entry and because all those companies had done really successful previously, right. you know, we see that that's probably a decent idea to invest. And so, you know, Viv has been doing absolutely incredible um, in the last few months. So just kind of giving a little, little bit of a, a taste of what the process of being a VC looks like there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, there's so many things to evaluate and I know, 
um, this conversation between you know team and product is such a big one in the in the industry, and I think every venture capitalist has their own little uh, balance or percentage that they allocate to that. So I was just wondering for you, uh, the old like you no know, the age old question: Which one do you value more? Do you think like the product or the team? That's a that's, a, that's such a tough question. I know it's <laughs> the, the controversy. Yeah. Um, I'll, 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 I think in terms of the context, I think definitely it's about product for me. Okay. I think product is a proxy for how successful a team can actually be Mm -hmm. Um, because there's a lot of people who are really great at sales. A lot of people who are really awesome at, um, you know, creating synergy and being a leader, but Mm -hmm. at the end of the day, you have to execute and and build a cool product. And so I think that's where, where it sits for me. Right. And I guess like you keep that space in order for startups to pivot because, you know, eventually a lot of them do, but you still want to make sure there's still a clear, like you want to make sure there's still a clear vision that they're, at least a direction that they know that they're yeah. going towards. And if the product doesn't have that, then it's really hard to capture that later on. Yeah, exactly. Like, I think what, what's most important is that they've, they've like having a strong product means you've tested some of your theses and you've, you've worked and tried to evolve um, right. because that's how you shape and that's how you actually advance and evolve. And if you, if you haven't really tested those theses, you can be the smartest people ever. And uh, you just, you, you just might fail because there's not product market fit. Right. Right. It makes sense. And so, Um, I guess, you know, another thing is, you know, in venture capitalism, you have to make sure you're keeping your emotions aside uh, when you're Mm -hmm. investing in startups. Um, And of course, as humans, that can be very difficult. So uh, when it comes to evaluating startups, how do you go about making sure your emotions are, you know, put aside while you're making these investments? Yeah, I mean, and that's a really, really complex challenge for for a lot of venture investors. Um, You know, with with odds on, I'm essentially the decision maker, so I can make the call on whether we write companies checks. Yeah. Um, and, and that leads to a lot of, you know, challenges, um, especially when it comes to, to problems that are very focused on issues that, you know, I face on a daily basis, you know? Right. So for example, a mental health startup focused on college students pitched to us recently. And, um, you know, that's an area that, you know, I've experienced a lot. I've seen friends experience a lot of trouble with. So, um, for me, it's like, I want that company to succeed as much as possible. Right. And, and whenever you kind of get into this mindset, it's kind of like a, a spiraling hole, right? So you, you mm-hmm. start thinking of, oh, how would I build this product? How can I help this company be successful? Um, and when you start thinking like that, instead of actually being more clinical and objective about how can they build the product and how are they building the product to succeed, right. um, that's where you get into a bit of a challenge because you're not the CEO. You're just a, you're a small check and round, or even if you're the lead investor, right? You, you only have so much influence over the company. Mm-hmm. I think the best way to, to balance emotions, um, this is one of my, one of the advice my, one of my good mentors, Matt Hayes at PJC gave me, um, is honestly just, just wait two days. Like think about the deal, have the meeting, get super pumped and then wait two days. Um, and once you do like your, your excitement will either continue and you'll realize, okay, cool. This is something we're really good about. Um, right. or it's, it'll falter and you'll realize, okay, I got kind of excited because it's a cool space. Entrepreneurs are really fun to talk to. Um, but the product might actually not be that successful and there are some, some real challenges. And so, you know, we ended up passing on that deal and it was a really hard pass for me because I could see how it could work, but, you know, logistically it just wasn't the right strategy. And, and I think that's, that's where you have to draw the line. Right. Yeah. I think emotions definitely get the better of you in the short term. So that's definitely great advice, I guess. Um, to just give, you know, there's no rush to do it. So give it some time, let your emotions like cool down, give it, you know, uh, give some thought and then, and then go from there. And I think that's such an important thing with uh, venture capital, because when you're making these investments, you know, you're in it for the long term, uh, for mm-hmm. the most part. Right. So you want to make sure that you're, uh, making sound investments or else, you know, you know, one bad investment could go haywire. Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and it's really interesting. I know there, there are a few funds that actually have a model where they, they decide whether they're going to invest or not on the first chat, like in the first 24 hours. Wow. Okay. Um, so it's, it's pretty interesting that there are a lot of different philosophies over this. Some people believe the initial excitement is really, um, this is my heart and my gut telling me this is the right call. Right. Um, other people kind of, port- and, and I'm more of the second camp, and other people believe um, it's more of, you know, you really thinking, um, just getting excited about cool ideas and cool people. Um, right. And I love meeting great founders. I love meeting great investors. And so uh, I get pretty excited pretty fast. And so I have to cool myself down a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, 
yeah, I think, it, you know, that investing philosophy is so different for so many different people. I mean, some people go purely by analytics. Some people go by, like you said, your gut. Um, so it's really interesting to see how different like funds succeed with these startups um, and the strategies they employ to, to go, you know, buy it. And so, yeah, um, yeah definitely super interesting. Um, and so, yeah, like, you know, sort of moving on, I guess, um, you you started a couple funds or you started, sorry, you started the UNC uh, Lex uh, Lux Libertas yeah. Ventures. And so how has starting a fund been? Um, and especially from this perspective, you know, uh, I've always thought about, you know, if I, if, you know, starting a fund will require a lot of capital. So how have you guys gone about doing that with a, with the venture fund? Yeah. So um, building a fund is very hard. Yeah. <laughs> um, no one tells you how hard it is until you, you start doing it. And then, then you realize this is a bad idea. <laughs> um, that's a fun idea though. I, I guess like my journey into kind of being in venture fund building really started with odds on. So um, Matt Hayes, he built this like kind of subsidiary fund underneath PJC called odds on ventures, mm-hmm. um, which pools from, from PJC's capital. And um, I was part of like the first small group of investors that was kind of like partners made those decisions on investment calls um, on what we were going to write checks to. And so, you know, that was less of the legal and logistical side um, and more of actually like initially shaping the thesis of the fund, making kind of being the key figurehead for a lot of these calls and a lot of these meetings with with potential startups. Right. Um, and so so that kind of introduced me to the idea of portfolio management of of how do you help pro- portfolio companies succeed and grow and all that. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was my first little foray before I, I really leapt into UNC Student Run Fund. Uh, and so you know, Lux Libertas, we've been we've been working through a few different variations of that since since June, honestly. Um, and so initially we're going to be like a nonprofit grant system for UNC. Um, then we started working within UNC's bureaucratic system to try to, you know, build a fund internally. Um, and, and now we're kind of currently in the process of, of just building the LLC separately and right. uh, currently we're trying to raise 2.5 million um, by August to, to write some checks. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we're largely meeting with fund of funds, you know, really cool UNC alumni to raise. Um, and, and I guess, honestly, a lot of the challenges, there's probably like two I'll really point to. Um, the first is this idea of people management. So no one really tells you what it's like to be a founder when everyone's super excited about your product, right? So, you know, you, you hear a lot of kind of people who are saying, okay, awesome. I love this company so much. I'd love to work here. Um, but then you also hear oh, bad hires can cost a lot of your time and energy and, and really kill a company. Right. And so even for a student focused, you know, fund, I mean, it's still a, largely a startup and similar to startups I've built previously. Um, and so you have to deal with a lot of the challenges of how do you not only manage the people on your team, how do you manage university stakeholders, how do you manage alumni, how do you manage, you know, public presence, um, a lot of these core concerns that, that, that feel outside of venture, but are just as important as, as pitching and, and probably more important. Um, right. with the presence. Um, and I think the second really large challenge is, is, is honestly just the fundraising process, right? Mm. So you know, we've had a lot of really great calls with, with, alumni who are interested in investing but getting the first check is is an absolute killer man um, <laughs> everyone wants like so the full what we've heard is everyone's interested in investing and everyone would be willing to write a check but no one wants to write the first check yeah um because the first check is, is 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 extremely extremely difficult to get especially when there's not like a a huge lead investor type system for for raising capital um for mm-hmm. venture capital funds so uh, those are kind of the, the main processes there, but it's, it's, it's going really well. I mean, we've, we've really helped to reshape UNC's entrepreneurship culture while um, just building the fund. So, so bringing in some really fancy people like, you know, Kevin Zhang, partner at Bain Capital Ventures, um, and, and even started focusing on diversity as well. So um, made like a women in VC panel and started exposing and democratizing information right. um, to be here. But honestly, like the, the fundraising process is, is killer, man. Yeah, I think, you know, that's, I guess that's something similar you can relate to with startups, right? <laughs> Whether it be a venture capital fund or it be a startup, that first check is so um, hard. And I, it really comes down to that investment and that vision, right? So the vision for the fund, what do you see the future of it being? And same thing with the startup, mm-hmm. what's the vision of the company? Um, and then beyond that, you have to hope, look, look at the personnel that do I think these people can execute on that vision? Um, yeah. And so once one person sort of takes that leap, I think it becomes a lot easier to convince other people to also do it. Mm-hmm. But that first check is super hard. Um, and so, no, it's really cool, man. What? So any any exciting companies that you guys have started investing in or is still in the initial like startup, like, you know, setup phase? 
Still, we're, we're still in the, the initial phases. I, there's a few companies that we're, we're looking at to potentially drop our first checks into, but uh, don't, don't want to disclose those yeah. publicly yet. But no um, what, what I will say, though, that's interesting about like the, the fundraising process um, is that I think student-run VC is a little unique from a lot of other funds. So student-run venture capital funds are popping up all across the, the nation. I mean, you got ones that like, you have the, the one in Southern California, you have your dorm room funds, your contrary capitals. Um, right. So there's a lot of models like this, but with university focused funds like Atlin Ventures and University of Minnesota that are run completely by students, the challenge is you're trying to get investors to invest in you um, when you're, you're basically switching managing partners every two years um, right. because of students. And so when, when LPs think of investing in venture capital funds, they're, they're investing largely in the team. So they're investing in Sanjeev, they're investing in like my co-founders, um, but they're not, but with student run VC, you know, you're, you're investing in the process. So the training process you're providing to managing partners, the university's partnerships with you. Right. Um, and so it's a bit of a difficult challenge and, and something that's, um, that a lot of funds have faced, but, but that's, it's a unique twist for a lot for student run VC. Right. And I think, you know, one of the biggest things with venture capitalism and, um, I guess it sort of segues into the next question, but, um, you know, at least the, at least the thoughts that I, or the, the, the judgment that I had was a lot of VC funds are looking for industry experience in order to, you know, make VC partners or, uh, in order to, uh, you know, in order to join these funds. But, um, at the same time, like, you know, there are a lot of fellowship programs and, and, uh, and other areas popping up. So I was just wondering in your, in your opinion, you know, what can students do to get into venture capitalism early on and build some skills to prep? And, and, and in general, do you think the space is moving towards industry experience, not necessarily being a, uh, you know, a blocker to get into venture capitalism? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. Um, I think largely for students, there are a few things that I would recommend that helped me. Um, the first is just start working at some really cool startups. So you know, working at Navis, leading like a, a, an out-of-state expansion project for them, like working with Bamboo, another Y Combinator startup on on like blockchain and crypto and crypto implementation for them. Um, you know, a lot of those projects give you the similar types of operator experience that venture capital funds will will look for. And and if you're you know trying to apply for a VC job and you have any type of operator experience, like that's a lot better than you know, just purely being a banker or purely being, you know, financial analyst at companies. Cause it shows that you, you know, you empathize and you understand, you know, what mm -hmm. good products look like. So that's like my first recommendation there. I think the second thing is that a lot of these fellowships are really solid. Um, there, there's a ton of them that pop out like NEA's fellowship, like Soma Capital's fellowship, um, you know, the Rebel One fellowship. There's, there's a ton of ways to gain access to the knowledge, but largely this, these fellowships just give you the baseline knowledge you need to actually, you know, engage with the industry, to learn the diligence processes, to learn, um, you know, traditional areas. Uh, but I think that, but they by themselves are not sufficient to get into VC. The, the right. real thing that matters most is how much you read and how much you learn about startups and venture capital, right? So if you think about it this way, like if you're in venture, you're spending probably 50, 60 hours a week talking to founders, reading about founders, reading about industries, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so what, what I recommend for a lot of people is, just open up like CB insights, open up TechCrunch, just start reading every single day for like 30 minutes, 45 minutes to see like if you enjoy that process. Um, because either you'll come away with a ton of knowledge that puts you far and beyond a lot of these other people. Because a lot of the, the interviews for ZBC are like, let's talk about a company, let's talk about an industry, let's talk about a trend. Right. And so you need to be far and beyond there or you realize you really don't like this job, right. um, which either way is, is pretty solid um, information to know. And I, and I think in terms of like the trends of, of whether experience is required, um, I think, you know, experience will, will always have a very important role in VC. I think you should, I think to get into VC, you always have to have a very clear interest in startups, like either have founded one or worked with one. Yeah. Um, but what I will say is that that experience is becoming easier to get. So, you know, you have like Y Combinator summer internship program, you have um, a lot of these student run venture capital funds and the proliferation of fellowships that are, that are occurring. Um, and, and with all of these things, it means that, you know, there are just more and more ways to get involved and to, to have the ability to engage. And so, you know, I think if you, if you are interested in venture, you have to go for it and just really try your best to network and, and engage with the process.
Right. Yeah, it makes sense. I think, you know, for a lot of people, venture capitalism seems like a sexy job. You just, you know, write checks to startups and and that's yeah. it. But they don't really see that process like that's behind it, which is researching these startups, researching the industry trends. There's a lot that goes behind it, right? Um, and so definitely, like, uh, I, I think that's great advice, you know, go on TechCrunch and read some of these startups. Yeah, I mean, I think... You know, that, that's kind of like, I remember uh, when I first started Odds On, like I didn't know anything about any industry. Right. Um, and so it was kind of like, you know, I was meeting some crazy founders and some really, really great companies. Um, but then I realized like, you know, you want to, when you interact with a startup, you want to make every interaction as value adding as possible for them because they're busy. Like they're taking 30 minutes, they're taking 15 minutes out of their extremely hectic schedule to talk to you. I um, mean, if you know nothing about like clean tech, if you know nothing about like blockchain, then, then why are you having this call? Like, how can, so even if you invest in them, how can you help them when you, when time comes? Like if you're not even right. willing to, to prep a little bit. And so I think reading, I think reading a lot will, will is just, it's, it's the most basic advice, but I think it's the one that most people miss, especially whenever they think about venture capital. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, and especially, you know, like, I guess this sort of comes back to what we talked about earlier, that those themes for a venture capital funds, I guess that's a really uh, big thing as well, that usually when a, a venture capital Fund is pretty themed and not general. That's because they have so much knowledge in the in that industry, so they know exactly what to look for. Yeah, and, and I actually think this is an interesting trend that's um, continuing to expand within venture capital writ large. Like, there's there's kind of been a decline in generalist funds and more of a focus on specific funds and at least specific verticals within funds. Right. Uh, because for for generalist funds, it's harder to make you know your your return to return the entire fund. Like you're shooting in a different pots, of course, but. Um, there's become so much diversity within, you know, each individual industry. Like, for example, NASDAQ Ventures got started in 2017 um, in, in the fintech industry, and they right. exclusively invest in financial technologies. And so that's a one industry focus, but the the level of depth and complexity and the sub niches underneath that umbrella have let them create incredible returns. Right. Um, so I, I do think there's going to be a, an increased expansion towards this idea of, of like one industry focus. Right. Um, as time moves on. Yeah, that makes sense. And I mean, um, yeah, it's, it's super exciting, man. So I guess for you, what's next? Yeah. So, um, obviously continuing to, to raise with Lux Libertas Ventures, you know, making, trying to make some, some, get some capital there, um, Mm -hmm. write those first checks. We're looking to close 2.5 million by August, um, and, and have a lot of fun building out that UNC infrastructure for us for, for like generations to come. Um, I'm also, you know, working on a book right now with, uh, Eric Custer at Georgetown's program um, focused on how Generation Z is fundamentally reshaping the way that consumers um, deal with products. And and so if you're a venture capitalist, you know, what do you, how should you kind of think about the world as it's moving forward? And, you know, and and for companies in particular, you know, where this, where does this new world order of Generation Z, um, what does that look like? And, And how should you resolve within it? Because, you know, my fundamental belief is that Gen Z is a uh, categorically distinct generation that's right. propelling this third industrial revolution and it's forcing this rapid transformation of society. Um, mm. And the world kind of dropped the ball when it came to the millennials um, who were kind of the first example of like what this could look like. And so um, love to kind of give that, that, that vision and that, that guidelines for, for companies and, and funds as they, as they move forward. Right. Yeah, no, it makes sense, man. I guess, you know, Gen Z is in a very, unique situation where we've grown up with the internet as a thing you know we've grown up with this hyper connectivity especially around the world um and it's really interesting to see like right now with the world with globalization global globalization still thriving but nationalism also being there and it's like a generational gap because of that right um, yeah super interesting stuff it's it's crazy like this this generational gap is um, I mean, it's facilitated everywhere, right? So, like, you had the boomers who were mad at Gen X, Gen Xs. You had the Gen Xs who were, you know, insulting the millennials. <laughs> Everyone hates millennials, apparently. I mean, yeah. it was crazy. Like, um, in 2016, there was like this one cert, like report published by Mintel, who's like a leading consumer analytics uh, firm, and they were like, Gen or millennials are killing cereal because like they're too lazy to clean up and eat that that cereal. And so it was like it was it was it, like the report was was garbage. Like it wasn't like that wasn't why they we're eating cereal, but it kind of represents this idea that a lot of people don't want to adjust for other generations and believe that every other previous generation is just, you know, poor or like not like emotionally weak, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Um, and for Gen Z, that's a, that's a huge problem because, you know, Gen Z is the most entrepreneurial and innovative generation in history. They're, um, you know, 
having this full digital native focus. So we've always had the internet, we've always had technologies um, mm-hmm. and having some of the highest design standards ever seen throughout history is really pushing a lot of industries forward. And, and um, we're at the cusp, essentially we have like two years before a lot of these companies have to respond when Gen Z infiltrates the workforce, when Gen Z becomes right. the dominant consumers. Um, and so now is a really, really critical drop off point for a lot of enterprises, a lot of funds and a lot of startups to adjust successfully. Right. I think one of the biggest things with Gen Z is um, like, you know, with every with startups before you didn't really have the tools to start it up. Like you needed capital in order to get those tools. But yeah. now, especially with software startups, right, which is a lot of startups, <laughs> a lot of primarily a lot of startups are in the software space now, I assume at least, um, you know, it's it's there's so much access to this technology. And so it's easy to start up and make a product really quickly without having to put too much capital. Um, and so it's really unique. Yeah, and I think no code is actually one of the most interesting spaces because it is leading to a lot of this ability to quickly beta test products, to quickly, um, you know, lead integrations. So like companies like Xavier, um, et cetera, like there's, there's a lot of ways for founders who are non-technical to get involved. And so um, the key question that's boggling industry's mind right now is like, if you're a non-technical founder, you have like a website built on Bubble, like a web app. Yeah. Is that backable? Um, and, and for me, that's probably, the answer is probably still a no. Um, because I just, I think that, you know, you have to have technical skills to, to scale up companies and you have to have the ability to, to, you know, modify your product as quickly and as, as, um, as successfully as possible to meet consumer demand. Right. Um, and most of these no code interfaces are great at creating first iterations, but but really not about that second level, mm-hmm. you know, iterations and infrastructure you need to grow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. But I think, you know, with like, as you mentioned, the no code space, one of the biggest things is just access to, uh, yeah. you know, to websites, to apps. Um, and as those, as that space grows, the more people that have access to these areas, the more innovation comes, right? Because there's so many different perspectives mm-hmm. that, that are able to come out and you don't necessarily need a technical co-founder every time in order to, uh, in order to put your idea into action. That's, so. that's exactly true. Yeah, no. Uh, one of my buddies, Michael Riley, he's a, a non-technical founder. Um, he's, you know, but he's in a lot of cool side projects, a lot of, you know, side hustles that ended up being extremely successful. And now he's built a company called um, Join Maslow, where he's like kind of working on um, breaking the nine to five for a lot of people. And so he, right now he's training people to run half marathons in like 30 days, mm-hmm. uh, which is, you know, absolutely crazy. Uh, because it, it it's all focused on Maslow's higher Maslow's higher hierarchy needs. So you know what do you like? You're working largely isn't what drives people's internal satisfaction. It's accomplishing like a sense of achievement um, that you get from doing crazy things like running a half marathon or like climbing Kilimanjaro or like swimming with bull sharks or whatever. <laughs> um, yeah. And so you know things like that are are largely and like that he I mean he doesn't know how to code and he he built a cool company with the Y Combinator founder. So a lot of, there, there is a lot of opportunity and a lot of pushing in innovation and disruption there. Yeah, no, it'll be super exciting to see, man. And um, yeah, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast. You know, it was a great conversation and I really enjoyed having you on. I appreciate it, David. Thanks as always. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for joining in and I hope everyone is staying safe and has a good day. Thank you.